Charlie Kamenoff is simply one of the most uh, brilliant uh, economists, uh, transportation analysts, scientists, urban scientists uh, that I have met. He's rejuvenated transportation alternatives. And so for me, this is very exciting to have what is the best tool that I have seen in my nearly 40 years of working on this. And it's getting better every time, I'm told by Charlie. But this is primarily a talk about this tool, the Balanced Transportation Analyzer, and not so much about the specific policy proposals that Ted and I uh, and others have been advancing that this tool supports. So as you can see, uh, the BTA is a spreadsheet model. It's geared to New York City, and it produces the outputs that are most important to transportation planners and public officials and the citizenry. Uh, agency revenues, the speeds at which vehicles will operate, the time savings that vehicles will get or drivers will get as a result of tolling, VMT, that's vehicle miles traveled, uh, and how many uh, tr uh, people will, will ride transit, and then emissions and other so-called externalities. Uh, these are some of the inputs. Um, there are actually many others, but the key, uh, we need baseline motor vehicle data, the, uh, the amount of vehicles that are driving into the, uh, into the cordon, the time of day, uh, that they drive the, and the day of the week, the speeds of these vehicles. Um, and we also need, and we've inputted um, baseline subway and bus usage, ridership and revenue, uh, the time of day and day of the week, and then equally important, uh, what we call price elasticities. These are the responsiveness of, dri of drivers and transit users to the cost and efficiency of transit uh, and driving. The origins of this report, as I noted, are in uh, Ted Keel's vision of free transit. Here's a shot of the, uh, the cover of the book that we produced uh, a year and a half ago. That was with an early version of this model. Uh, and we now have what we call the Enhanced Balanced Transportation Analyzer uh, 1.1. Why are we doing this? Just very quickly. Uh, the, the, the bedrock principle is that traffic pricing is essential to improving vehicle travel. And until you charge a market clearing price, and the price that you charge is dependent on how clear you want to make the streets, and more importantly, the political viability of it. Until you do that, you're not going to make a real permanent dent in gridlock. You can maximize the time savings, because if you charge a higher price at the peak times, you'll discourage that kind of travel the most, and you'll uh, maximize your time savings. You provide choice to people, which is important, especially in our political system. Uh, and you can ease subway crowding if you do time of day pricing on the subways. The BTA also provides or allows for instant modeling. You don't uh, have to wait, as is the case with the official models, days, weeks, or months to screen different policies that you might be proposing. So uh, you could examine toll changes, fare hikes, service changes. If, if service is going to be curtailed on subways, there's a way to model uh, how that's going to affect uh, subway usage, and then subway revenues, and then induced traffic, um, and public space reallocation. We actually have a switch in the, uh, in the model that allows us to uh, take any amount of street space out of service, away from vehicles, uh, and then you see how traffic speeds change in response to that. And uh, the notion is that by making this all transparent, you demystify the whole idea of traffic planning. Some of the strengths of the BTA, we've designed it so that you, we have, you can divide the 24 hours of the day into as many as seven different time periods. Um, we, we, as I said, we've got weekends separate from weekdays, time variable subway pricing, and these important interactivities. And finally, the idea is that anyone pretty much can use it. The average vehicle speed uh, in the central business district over those 12 hours of the day is just eight miles an hour. Slow speeds have a disproportionate impact on, uh, on average speeds. Now, the way that the model works, or the, the heart of the model, is this idea. 
Uh, every trip that's driven into the CBD has an out-of-pocket cost. Some of those trips are now paying tolls. Some aren't, but some are. Many of those trips are paying to park. Not all, but many of them are. Um, there's gasoline costs. Now, when you add a toll to that, you increase the price. And based on the price elasticity of driving, you get a reduction in the number of trips. Now, uh, we also have a time switching propensity between periods. If you charge different prices for different times of the day, you're going to get some shifting. Uh, and then you also have uh, switching between uh, driving and transit. And you combine all these to calculate new volumes of trips. When you charge a toll and you have less traffic, then opportunistic drivers are going to rush in to fill that vacuum. And maybe not all of it, but some of it. And how much they fill depends upon the relationship between the price elasticities and the time elasticities. So when you start with 870,000 trips a day into the CBD, if you charge one of the tolls that we've modeled, which is either three, six, or nine dollars to drive into the heart of the city, depending upon the time of day, you will lose about 180,000 of those trips. But then the roads are so clear that they fill up again, not entirely, but to some extent. Now the roads are more crowded and trips take longer. And so the time elasticity kicks in in reverse. Some of those trips disappear and you get this. I guess it's the Yogi Berra-ism. You know, it's so crowded no one goes there. Uh, and we've literally had in our model to take these oscillations through about 10 iterations to get to the point where the pendulum stops swinging. We're not resting our findings on a notion that people might find simply unrealistic, that everybody is going to shift their travel time in order to uh, pay only $6 instead of $9 or pay $3 instead of $6. Uh, but the terrific thing about even this little amount of time shifting is that it produces disproportionately positive gains in driver's time because you're backing away from that hyper-congested peak period. And now we have a similar thing on the subways and what's uh, happening here. Now, most of this is increases. And here we modeled if you had uh, fares that were either $2 in the morning peak and the evening peak, $1.50 in some of the adjacent periods, $1 or 50 cents in some of the others, and then zero uh, in the middle of the night. And what happens as a result of those prices, the model predicts, is that you have these reductions in the two peak hours, and then you have increases everywhere else. So this is not just time shifting, it's also the induced demand because the average subway fare under this plan would have been like 79 cents instead of $1.52. But the, the takeaway from this is that by charging a differential price on the subway, you have the possibility of reducing peak usage. And the most important thing is that we can calculate the delay that one additional trip by car or truck into the central business district, the delays that that trip is imposing upon everybody else that's in the traffic stream. The model simulates that by hypothesizing, what if 100 more cars were driven into the central business district every day? Well, we can recalculate the speeds inside and outside the CBD, and there's actually a tiny little gray thing here in the graveyard, it's microscopic. Because if I drive in from Sheepshead Bay at two in the morning, I don't really add to anybody else's congestion costs because first of all, there are so few vehicles on the road that uh, there aren't that many people for me to bug. And second, I'm not slowing them down because I'm not really taking away necessary capacity. The system is operating well within capacity. But as traffic increases, these change. By driving in uh, from six to nine, I'm causing 2.4 hours of delay to everybody else that's on the roads during that same time. That's not, I'm not causing that to one person, that's the sum total of all those seconds. Now we put price tags on these. And we've got um, values of time. And these numbers here of the value of time, these are distillations of uh, what we estimate to be the value of driver's time, uh, a vehicle hour uh, driven within the central business district on a weekday has an average value to the average driver 
uh, and, and the people in his or her, her car or truck of uh, about $50. Uh, within the CBD on weekends, it's uh, only about $29, and then outside the CBD, it's less. If you drive in during the AM peak, um, and again, we don't know when you're leaving, so that's randomly distributed, your trip is creating delay costs of about $120 total to everybody else that happens to be on the roads within the metropolitan system uh, at that time. However, these delay costs are very sensitive to the assumptions we're making as to how much traffic there is on the road. The result of having 5% less traffic now in 2009 than was in 2007 is that all these delay costs are less than I was just showing by about um, 14 or 15%. Now, under this plan that we've been uh, talking about, here are the, uh, the impacts. We would lose almost a billion and a half dollars uh, at the transit fare box. I, I should say that this, this plan provides for free buses and it approximately drops the subway fare in half. We save a tiny bit of money because we don't have to maintain the bus toll collection machinery. We pick up this much from the toll. Um, we, we have to spend not a huge amount of money to administer the toll. And very importantly, we pick up a lot of money through a taxi surcharge, which in this particular plan is a 33% taxi surcharge, not just on the drop, but on the mileage and on the time. And what the taxi surcharge does is three things. It provides revenue that we badly need. Uh, it helps ensure that taxi use doesn't rush to fill up that nice space that we've created within the central business district. And, uh, and we balance the tolls more equitably. This is what would happen to vehicle speeds. Depending upon the time of day, we have bigger gains at other times of day, and there's an analogous uh, thing that we, have in, that we don't show here on the weekends. What are the benefits of doing all this? And we have six categories of benefits. The fiscal benefit, that's that $10 million net from before, so that's nothing. You know, this is designed to be revenue neutral. The health benefit, uh, is actually the uh, improved, increased physical activity that more people, we believe, will bike and walk when there's less traffic. Air pollution from cars is a relatively minor issue at this point uh, because of the improved technology. But what I want to focus on is the time savings. This is the real benefit, and that's what I think public policy, uh, you know, advocacy should focus on because there needs to be a congruence between what are the objective benefits of something like this and the way in which it's advocated for. Once a certain traffic density is surpassed, every driver contributes involuntarily to a slowing of traffic. It, I, it's nice. It's, sort of, it's, it's not their fault. It's involuntary. They don't want to, but this is the way that the world is set up. The time that the individual driver steals from all the others by slowing them down is greater many times over than the time he or she might have hoped to gain by taking the car. This is a classic you know, prisoner's dilemma, externality trap. And the only way to get out of this trap is to charge a toll that internalizes some. And, we're, and the, the tolls we're talking about are really, you know, one-tenth of the time costs that the driver would be imposing upon others by taking that trip. It's really a baby step uh, substantively, but obviously it will be a giant step politically.